Good morning. I want to welcome you in the name of our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you all for being here and um, going to have a great day of worship this morning. I have just a couple of announcements. First, this morning is Mission Sunday. If you want to give towards the, uh, our missionaries on the white envelope, it's got a few uh, ways you can do that. You can give to the general offering, you know, to Joe Ash, whatever, and there's a spot for missions on there as well. So if you want your uh, gifts to go to missions, put it in the envelope, uh, mark missions on the, or circle the missions or check it or whatever on the side. Uh, tomorrow is also the away from the campus senior lunch at Bella Milano in Belleville. Is that Shiloh? Okay. Bella Milano in Shiloh. That's the, did, did I say that right? Bella Milano. Bella. Okay. Yeah, no. I'm too German to do that. Um, and that's at 11:30. So seniors, uh, you can show up for that. And Lisa, stop being has an announcement. Good morning. I'm excited to announce that we're starting our fifth year as a Secret Sister Ministry. We've had so much fun and so many uh, answers to prayer and seeing God work in these ladies' lives. But today is the last day to get your paperwork to me. So if you do not have your paperwork and you want to participate, you need to fill that out today. I'll stay as long as you need. My husband's not here, so I can stay as long as I need for you to fill it out so that you don't miss out. But I need this today because when I leave here today, I'm going to go home and I'm going to mix it all up. And next Sunday, you ladies that have your paperwork uh, to me will get your new secret sister for the year, for the whole year, in your mailbox. So if you want to join, don't miss out on this great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Well, um, it is good to see you all here. It's good to see Jolene back with us after that little episode that you had. Good to see her back with us. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of people out with this, whatever this bug is going around. Um, Vivian's now, she's homesick. So there's just so many um, things going on. We really need to, uh, pray for healing for our congregation. You know, we need to focus that prayer. And been learning like in uh, our elders meeting yesterday that, you know, prayer is, I mean, you come into that realm with Jesus Christ when you pray. You know, he, he's, you, you come in and you join him. You know, you, you're, you're praying and, you know, it's, it's and I, I mentioned it's like talking to your friend. You know, you can't, run the conversation you gotta sometimes can i say it nicely shut up and listen you know what i mean um but uh and we need to uh just just focus on uh, on what we're praying about you know you don't have to go into any big long speeches or anything like that focus on what you're praying for you know be direct and uh god knows that uh, we have needs and by showing by praying we're showing that we depend on him, and I think we do, don't we? And uh, for everything, yeah. So would you stand with me this morning as we open in prayer? And um, while I'm praying, you know, if there's some, someone that comes to your mind, go ahead and uh, pray for that individual. And uh, we just really need to ask for a lot of healing for our, our brothers and sisters here. Father, we do come to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, the living Messiah, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we come in to your presence this morning uh, in his name, Father, as you said to. So we come giving him praise and honor and glory this morning. All that we have is from you, Father. We thank you for the many blessings that you give us each day, even those blessings that are dis disguised as uh, problems. Father, you know you want to, we, we know that you want to conform us to the image of your son, so, Father, we, we just uh, depend on you to do that. Father, we praise you because you are holy. 
We pray that your will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, we're just so thankful that you love us so much that you gave your only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Everlasting life, Father. And that doesn't happen when we when this body passes away, it starts now. Father, we're, we're living that now. So we just ask that you would lead us and guide us this day that our worship of you may be pleasing. Father, we lift up those in our congregation that are not feeling well, Father. Sickness, so much of that going on. And it comes on so fast that we're unprepared sometimes. But Father, nothing surprises you. So we just lift those up. In our, in our congregation that are ill and need that touch from you. Father, we know there are also others that are, are away from us for uh, different reasons. So we just ask that you would minister to all, all those in our congregation, Father, that we may, um, even though we might be going through some rough times, still <coughs> rejoice in the Lord. So, Father, we thank you for this time that we have. Pray that all that we do and say would be pleasing and honoring to you. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Hello. Oh, you're picking them up. Okay, yeah, my bad. Um, in the pew in front of you, there are some prayer cards that if you have a need, fill those out, put them, send them to the middle, and put them in that little crack between the uh, armrest of the pew there in the back of the pew. And you picking them up? Yeah. Rich is picking them up this morning. So, uh, okay, good, good. Well, good morning, everyone. Hey, our, our first song... Um, some of you that are a little bit more mature uh, may know it, uh, but we've never sung this song here before. Uh, it was one of the songs we sang at Word of Life a lot, and uh, I've always had a great appreciation for it, never been able to find the music, and then Todd, in much diligent research, found it. <laughs> so we're going to sing through it once. If you know it, join in. There's uh, th There might be some clapping, so... For anyone that comes out of the Baptist background, don't worry, we haven't crossed over. Um, <laughs> but I, I think you're going to like it. And then we're going to sing through it a second time so that you guys can grab a hold of the words and run with them, okay? All right. Celebration of praise. Come on along with me and sing. Shout So we're going to sing to it again because, uh, and a little bit faster. Uh, oh, I feel like I'm dragging up here, okay? I know it's hard to get all those words in there, but we can do it, okay? So come on along with me and sing. Let's go for it. Come on along with me and sing.
Okay, now just in case some of you think we've gone over to the dark side or something like that, uh, and we haven't, I don't know about you, but that's just good music, right? Okay, good. Um, our next song, especially in today's day and age, there, there is no fear of God before their eyes. When, when we pray for our leaders, we pray that some of them might find the fear of the Lord. Because someday, every knee is going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen? So let's sing about it. that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then in verse 18 of John chapter 1, it says, no one has seen God at any time. Now, the first time I really caught that, I'm thinking about all the people that had seen God in the Old Testament. But they didn't see God in all of his glory. It goes on to say, The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. He has revealed him. Meekness and majesty.
you can sit down. I couldn't hold it that long either. At this time, if our men would come forward to receive our offering. You know, um, when you think about how God, how good God has been to each of us, uh, he calls on us to give us, he has given to us. And I'm not using that to manipulate you to give you more, or to, for you to give more. I'm just saying that's what he's called us to do. So as we do so, let us do so with thanksgiving. And then uh, the song that we're going to be singing I know some of you, you're going to want to stand because it says I stand. So as the plate passes you, then you can stand. Just wait until the plate, because if you stand up, they won't know where they've been and where they're going. Okay? And, and that's just because, <laughs> I'm sorry, I did this once before, and, and the guys got lost and missed a couple of uh, aisles, you know. We don't want that to happen. Let's, let's give thanks. Father, we thank you. You've been so good to us in so many ways. Uh, Lord, we, we recognize that you, we need you in everything. You, you provide for us in, in every way, uh, e even with the distinct uh, air freshener this morning. We, we know that you give us oxygen, you give us um, the food, you give us the light, uh, the warmth of the sun, and w we thank you. We thank you for your son that you gave us, sacrificing him so that we might have a relationship with you. Thank you for jobs, for the provision uh, that those bring. And as we give back a portion of that which you've blessed us with, Lord, uh, give wisdom to both the church as they use those funds as well as each of us as we use that which is, uh, remains, that uh, you might be honored and glorified in, in all. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad that you are here today. I'm glad I'm here with you. I get to be a part of the fellowship and community that we have here. God is good to us. We've had a good week. But God is good to us because we have a good Savior. We have a great, a great life together with Him. Today is our, our celebration of the Lord's table. And once again, we remind you that these are elements that He's given to us as a memorial. This is how we remember the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the many ways, remember, I hope that every day you're remembering the Lord Jesus Christ. Every moment you remember the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is one of the ways that we do it together. This is a communion. It's, uh, it's made to be remembered together. It has two elements in it. It has bread. It has uh, juice. And the bread is to remind us of the sinless life of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is God come in the flesh. He starts that way. But beyond God come in the flesh, he also lived a holy and just perfect life. Now, he's doing that in our place. Remember, he's going to be our substitute. He's living this holy life in our place to give us his holy life when he dies on the cross to pay for our sins to take away the old life. Then giving us the resurrection, he gives us a brand new life in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And this is a way to celebrate and remember that. When you take it to your remembering this, you're saying that Jesus is God come in the flesh. That's what we mean by that. We are saying before all the angels gathered to watch our order this morning, before all the people who are here, before anyone else, I'm declaring that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'm declaring that he is God come in the flesh and that there will be no other. He is the Messiah. Then when I drink the juice, I'm saying to myself, I know that Jesus was fully human. And as a full human, he gave his life for us. He took my penalty on himself. The wages of sin is death. And he took that penalty on himself and paid for my life in full. He's not paying for simply an event in your life or events in your life. He's paying for your life. Our iniquity has been laid on him. The whole twist of who we are has been laid on him. And he's now paid that whole price. You're a free person because of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to ask that you wait till all are served. And we'll give uh, thanks uh, at that time and bless the, the food that we'll be participating in. So let's look to the Lord just now in prayer. And then, fellows, if you'll come forward. Father, thank you so much for the gift of this beautiful day for the wonderful things that have been given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for a great week, Father. Thank you for the way you watched over us again. Thank you for your goal of making us look just like Jesus Christ. Forgive us when we forget that and complain about the things that are going on in our lives. We ask you to help us to be grateful in everything for all that you're doing. For you are the one true God. There isn't anyone like you, and we thank you and praise you that you have given Jesus. We're going to thank you for the bread that we're going to eat, that we're going to remind ourselves of the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is and what he did, and then the blood we're going to remind that he paid for our lives in full, and we're going to remember because we're meeting here on this Lord's day of his great resurrection. Thank you for what you're going to do in us in Jesus' name. Amen. You don't have to be a member of this church to participate with us here, but you must be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, please, please just wait until we get opportunity to share with you the good news of Jesus Christ, and you can trust him then. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him.
And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated by, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Now, if you take the top off there, you find the bread that's there. I'll give a little blessing to this bread. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi Lachem Min HaAretz. That is, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, the King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Let's remember that Jesus Christ is King of kings, Lord of lords, and he is God come in the flesh. Now, if you take the top, the rest of the top off, please, and reveal the juice beneath there, we'll remember that Jesus Christ shed his blood for us, gave his life for us. And in exchange, gave us his righteous life. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu malach ha'olam, borei peri ha'gafen. Let's remember him together that Jesus Christ shed his blood for us. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. We're looking forward to that. The Lord Jesus Christ is on his way. It's pretty clear that the prophecies that he spoke, I was listening to a, a program the other day and a guy said, can you imagine some Christians today think that Jesus is coming back again and Israel is a part of that, that Israel has to be a state? Of course, they got all excited when 1948 Israel became a state. And I thought, do you understand what you just said? Why are we excited about that? Because they hadn't been a state for 2,000 years. And all of a sudden they are, like overnight. That's a sign of his coming again. God bless you. Father, thank you so much for that which reminds us that we are in a covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ and our lover, our Savior, our God is coming back for us soon. Thank you for it, Fathers. Make us faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. It's time for Children's Church to be dismissed. God bless you as you head on your way there. Have a great time.
I enjoyed our praise time this morning together. It's not about whether I enjoyed or not. It's about whether the Lord was pleased with what we were doing, that we do it in faith and believing Him and trusting Him and in worship of Him. Al said that uh, we have not crossed to the dark side, and I'm, I appreciate that. But however, Rich Bachman asked, isn't there a dance that's supposed to go with that? I said, yes, and we're crossing over the dark side next week. We are going to be dancing next week. All right, but praise the Lord. Speaking of next week, just wanted you to know that the, uh, uh, Bob Vandenbosch is going to be with us next week. We always love to hear from Bob Vandenbosch. He is a, a, a great brother in Christ. He'll be with us next Sunday. So tell all your friends that uh, Bob is going to be with us. Bob Vandenbosch is a lobbyist in Springfield for Christian values, for family values, and he does a great job. He's been there for years. He knows the people there, and he's got, uh, he's got several Bible studies going. Just, you, you're going to hear some good things from him for next week, all right? So be looking forward to that. Three. Did you think of three? Three things that you're grateful for, three things that you're praising God for. I'll enter his gates with thanksgiving. I'll enter his courts with praise. Now we're ready to worship. And I've, I felt like we've had a good opportunity this morning to be about that. We are going to ask that you break up into small groups, if you would. Matter of fact, let's, let's go ahead and have our Bible reading. So if we can have our uh, uh, responsive reading, we'll have it now. I'm going to ask you to stand as we read this one. Short passage today, but uh, nonetheless, it's packed with some good stuff. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And together, or I'm sorry, then they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he comments, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. All right, God bless you. You can be dismissed. Or dismissed. You can sit down. Don't go any place yet. Please don't go any place. Wait. You can have a seat there. And if you would, gather up in groups of prayer so that you can have some prayer together, all right? We'd appreciate that a whole bunch. All right.
Father, thank you for the great gift that prayer is. Thank you that you are there to hear, to listen. And thank you for your loving compassion, that you are like a friend to us. We know that you are authority. We know that you're the, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. But we want to thank you for the favor you've shown to us, letting us be drawn into your family like this. We give you praise for that. Part of our family is sick, Father. And we ask in the name of Jesus that your kind mercy, because you are Rafa, that you'll bring healing to them, restoration. Thank you for those like Versi that you put into good health again, Father. And we pray that in Jesus' name, bless them. Thank you for the Langston's today, Father, and for Doreen, Stephanie, and for little Everly. I ask, Father, in Jesus' name that you'll minister health and healing and encouragement to that family as well. Thank you for the kindness you've shown in, in helping us to know who Jesus Christ is. And thank you for those who want to make Jesus Christ known all around the world. I lift up Steve and Stephanie, and I ask for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll minister the Kellys there in Bangladesh. Grant them, Father, they might have the peace of God that passes all understanding, that the things which bring them anxiety and concern might be set aside by your great love for them and kindness for them. For the Archibalds, Father, that in Jesus' name you'll minister great grace and strength and healing and encouragement to them. Keep them strong in the Lord and the power of his might and give them good wisdom, vision, and insight. That you might prosper the Portugals in Spain, Father, that you'll give to them the good things that they need. Thank you for Marty Zide, Father. I ask you to make him fruitful in all Jewish ministries and for Andy Ferrier. Thank you, Father, for the many people that you're working through, like Bob Vandenbosch like all the organizations that we get opportunity to uh, sponsor and help and support. Thank you, Father, for all the good work that you're doing all around this world. We do pray for our leaders that you would give them a fear of God, for it is clear that many times they're operating in pure flesh or impure flesh as it is. Thank you for it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. If you take your Bibles, please turn them to Mark chapter 1. Verse 21, I'm going to speak this week uh, on uh, spirits, and I think that we will probably have a part two on this as well, uh, the, the following, uh, following Bob's uh, time here on the 18th. I have some more things I want you to uh, know and, and understand. These are things that I've come into uh, through just plain study. Uh, that's been a, a great thing, and I'm always grateful for the good teachers that, that God has uh, shown me over the years. Uh, A.W. Tozier was a great teacher. I didn't ever get to meet him personally, but I love A.W. Tozier. I appreciate what that man had to say. Charles Spurgeon was another that I had great, deep respect for in the things that he taught. Andrew Murray was another. There are many teachers. Michael Heiser is another. There's a number of really good teachers that I've had. Uh, I've, I've appreciated reading the church fathers. I've appreciated uh, coming to know what's, what some of their thoughts on the, on the scriptures were all about. But there is no greater person than the Lord Jesus Christ. He is it. And the greatest teacher you're going to have is the Holy Spirit. So pray for each other all the time that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher. That when we listen to and look at the Word of God, that the Word of God is made known to us by the Spirit of God. Because that's how it's going to happen. It isn't just intellectually grasped. This is something that is uh, spiritually grasped. Well, today, looking at the Mark uh, 1, 21, which you look with what it says here. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and, and taught. Um, the, the Scriptures are written originally in Koine Greek. And God has blessed me with opportunity to study that and get to know some of that. And I was interested when I was doing some translation work on this one right here. I came across this, th that word Sabbath, it's not singular. It's plural. And I thought, why would it be plural? It's because he didn't go in one Sabbath. He went every Sabbath to there. He went to the synagogue every Sabbath. That's what he was all about. Why? He is the Lord of the Sabbath. 
Okay? He is Lord of Sabbath. He's going to honor it and respect it. He knows what it's for. He knows what's behind it. So I thought, since they've talked about that, and one of the things they, they say was, uh, and uh, in verse 22, and they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. And I thought, of course. Of course he taught them as one having authority. So I thought, I'm going to talk to you about why Jesus was so important in this particular synagogue. Why Jesus was so significant of the things that happened in there. Number one, he had the authority to teach truth. Where did he get that authority? He is the eternal Word of God. John says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is that Word. If there's anybody that's going to know what the Word means or what the authority of the Word is, it's Him. He's its author, He's its source. Colossians chapter 1 tells me that he's the source of truth and the creator of truth. It says, in him, in Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, if I can speak to the students for just a minute. Maybe you're a student uh, of, of a school, a high school or something like that. Or maybe you're a student in college. Wherever you're a student, I want you to listen to this. In Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You are studying wisdom and knowledge. People are trying to impart to you wisdom and knowledge. Sometimes they're imparting more knowledge than they are wisdom. Here's what I'd like to encourage you to do. Get a personal relationship with Jesus Christ that's a living, vital relationship. Don't just trust Him and say, good, I'm going to heaven now, it's all done. No, no. He is the source. I want to tell you, even though the Muslims are the one who found algebra, beyond them is the one who made algebra. Now, I, I, I may have just said something there that made some of you say, oh, I don't like Jesus anymore because I don't like algebra. Okay. Let me tell you, Jesus is the source of every mathematical engineering thing there can be. Jesus is the source of all music, all music that could ever be written. He's the source of it. Can I tell you, he's the source of all language. He's the source of all imagination. He's the source of everything that is in this world. He is the author of history. He's the mover of history. It's what makes it go from one point to another. You can't do better than be into a personal relationship with the source of truth in any of your studies. And in that, can I just share with you those who have done that? Daniel is one such individual who did that. Daniel studied the Word of God, knew the Word of God, had a relationship with God, and was wiser than all the other wise men who had studied all their lives. Daniel, because of his relationship with God, was given new understanding in truth. That's the one who's come to teach in this synagogue in Capernaum. <laughs> can you imagine that? This is, there should be like a, a, a billboard that says, tonight, Lord Jesus Christ, source of all wisdom and truth, teaching. And I, but instead it comes in the way he wanted it to, like a humble servant, like every other Jewish guy. And he's walking in there and speaking like they've never heard it before. He's the source of all truth. And he's the, he is teaching what his Father has given him to teach. John 12, 49, Jesus said, don't think that I'm teaching my own teaching. I am saying to you what my Father told me to say to you. Because Jesus' life is always submitted to the Father. He knows what the Word is. He is the Word Himself. He speaks not only the Word, but He knows the true meaning behind it. You know, uh, you remember back in your literature classes when you had to read um, any, any, any suggestion of Silas Marner? I don't know if any of you ever had to read Silas Marner. Dark stuff. You're, you know, wow. And you, and you read through this thing. And then somebody's got the audacity to say, what did he mean? What did he mean? Goodness, I had enough trouble working through the words. Now I've got to know what he meant, too. Or they want to know what, what, the, what the poet meant by what he had to say here. Um, Voyage of the Mariner or whatever it was. There. You're supposed to read through that and you're supposed to know. There are all kinds of interpretations about what this, this poet meant or that poet meant or this prophet meant or this writer of the Gospels meant.
But I can tell you this. Jesus knows exactly what he meant. And when he's speaking to them in this synagogue, they're getting the whole story. They're not just getting the words. That's what the the scribes and the lawyers knew. They are getting the meaning behind it. So he's given all that authority. Why is he there? Let me talk to you just for a moment about the authority of presence. We have a that, that purple banner back there, that talks about Jehovah Shammah, or Shammah, I should say, not Shammah, that would be the Lord who hears us. That's the Lord who's present. He is always present for things. He is the creator of all that is. Colossians 1 tells us, we, I read some of that to you this morning, he is the creator of all that is. He's the one who brought life into existence. He's the one who called Abraham and blessed Israel. Can I say, this is Israel that's getting to hear this authority speak, and he's the one who called, he's the one that even formed Israel. If there's anybody that's got a right to be in this synagogue, it is this one here. He has the authority of presence. So when he comes in that synagogue, it's right that he should come in and teach. Just imagine, he walks in, he's not the rabbi of that synagogue, he's not the moderator of that synagogue, he walks in as a rabbi, picks up the scroll, and teaches from the scroll. It's his scroll. It's his synagogue. You you understand what I'm saying? That's why he should be there. You're going to ask me in just a minute why that's important. I'll show you. There is the authority over chaos. He is the one who brought authority over chaos. <clears throat> he has come to restore the order of the kingdom of God. Remember when John is preaching, he said he's preaching about the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. Get ready. Prepare you the way for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus preaches the same thing. The kingdom of God is at hand because there's disorder in the kingdom of God. And Jesus is here to restore order to the kingdom of God. Let me take you all the way back here to creation. Sometime back here around creation, and I couldn't tell you the time because the Scriptures don't tell us the time, but Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 both tell us that there was a time back here when one of the cherubim, one of those cherubim decided on his own that he was pretty, he was smart, he was better than anything else, and that he might as well have a position that's as high as God himself. And with that little rebellion brought chaos into the kingdom of God. God had created the world with the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth. He had had angels in all the heavens. He had had people on all the earth, people in all their animals and all that, and heaven is full of angels and all the hosts that's there. They had had both of those. With this disruption in the kingdom of heaven and that one bringing it to the kingdom of earth, you had a disruption in the kingdom of earth. You had a disruption in the kingdom of heaven. You have a disruption in the kingdom of God. That's what both of them are. Does that make sense? You have disruption in either of those, and you have disruption in the kingdom of God. He's come to restore that order. Why can he do it? With the Father and the Spirit, he brought order out of chaos and formed the world. In Genesis 1, the earth is without form and void. It's in chaos. It's in disorder. So what he's going to do, he's going to begin to speak to it, and order is going to be formed out of it. He's going to speak to the waters. The waters split, and land is going to appear. He's going to speak to the land, and it gets vegetation on it. He's going to keep creating day in, day out. And as he creates those things, he's bringing order out of the chaos. If anybody could bring order back to the chaos, it's this one. He's the Son of God. He's the one who has the authority to do it. He formed all things with purpose and order. When he creates all things, he's creating them so that they are all interdependent, they're symbiotic, they are working together, they're interactive. He's got them all working together so good, so well, that he can come to day seven and back off and say, I don't have to do anything else now. Everything's working as it should. And he took a day of rest just to watch it all marvelously work together. If anybody could restore order out of the chaos, it's this one. He's the Lord over all of that. When sin disrupts the order, it is God who restores the order. 
When an unclean spirit creates chaos in the synagogue, it's Jesus who speaks up to reorder the occasion. So this whole thing is about a spirit that is in the synagogue that Jesus has the authority to be in, and that one doesn't. This is not his realm. This is not where he's begun. If I can say, that's going to be one of the things that makes him an unclean spirit. He is where he does not belong. Things become unclean when they are not uh, what, doing the thing they were intended to do. Uh, if, if you have a corpse, it's unclean. Why? Because the body was intended to be alive. It's not alive, so now it's unclean. When there is a, a, a sexual problem going on, it's because it's not doing it the way it was intended to be done. That makes it unclean. It makes, things uns it makes things ceremonially unclean when they are not done the way they're supposed to do. Consequently, if you have somebody that's on their way to synagogue, and along the way they see a corpse, they're not to touch that corpse. Why? The corpse is unclean. If they touch the corpse, they also are unclean. And that means they cannot go to synagogue. They cannot go to temple. They cannot go to any worship service. They can't do anything because it's unclean. And what you have in the synagogue where the authority is teaching the truth, you have a spirit that's not supposed to be there disrupting the order of, of the, the good teaching that's going on there and crying out. He has authority over the spirits. Jesus created all spirits. There are no spirits. That, there, matter of fact, there's nothing in this cosmos that he didn't create. Everything, down to every atom and molecule, everything was created by him and him alone. And he created all those spirits. Consequently, as the creator of those spirits, he has authority over all those spirits. All right? He's ruler over the spirits. And letter C, if you can outline, all spirits know exactly who he is. Why? They are in his presence in the kingdom of heaven all the time. Why would it be easy for them to recognize Jesus in a synagogue? Because they've already known who Christ is in heaven. They've been worshiping him or serving him and been around him since the day of their creation. Since the day that Jesus brought them into this world, they've known him. So they are a little surprised to see him in a human frame. A little surprised to see him there in the synagogue. Why? Well, well his, his home is heaven, isn't it? What's he doing down here? The Scriptures say that was such a big puzzle that when he came into his own, his own didn't recognize him. He came to all his own, not just his own people, but to the whole of creation didn't recognize him. But I tell you this, Creation did get to recognize him when you're a fig tree that didn't produce what you're supposed to produce. When he says to the fig tree, you're dead, and it's dead. When he says to the wind, to the storm, cease, and it stops. When he tells the waters to stop moving, and they stop. Or when he tells the water, you're not water anymore, you're wine. That's authority, kids. And he has authority over all of that. And he has authority over every spirit. So this spirit that's there, not recognizing Jesus, not knowing why Jesus is there, is recognizing him and knowing who he's talking to. All right? So if you would, consider with me uh, the second page. There are only two people in that room who know who Jesus is. Now, the disciples are in that room, but the Scriptures let us know that they haven't quite figured him all out yet. They got an idea that he might be a prophet, and they got an idea that he pr really is a man of God because he does some pretty unique things, and his teachings with authority. Maybe he's like Moses. So maybe they're ready to care, compare him to Moses or, or maybe one of the prophets. They do not know yet that he is God come in the flesh. Oh, they're going to get to know it as they go along. But kids, they're in training for three years. And it's close to the end of the third year that they finally recognize you're a God come in the flesh. 
you're going to have to know that there are going to be some times during that time that they are wondering, if he's God come in the flesh, how are we still alive? This is mercy. This is grace that we should continue to live because who could see God and live? It's not in their paradigm. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not in their realm of understanding. He's in a different category, and rightly so. How many people have been in that category before? Zero. Second page. Is this one questioning his authority or his timing? Uh, look, if you would, at verse 23. And there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What are we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. All right, now would you stop and look with me. Um, once again, I'm going to try to translate this thing. And as I'm translating, I'm saying, I don't even understand what that means. There's a phrase that's written here that the uh, translation that I have has, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Actually, it says this. What's between me and you? What are you doing here? What's between me and you? I've been living here with this guy for a long time. What are you doing here? So he's asking this question. He's upset with him. What are you doing here? Are you coming to destroy us? Let's break that down a little bit, shall we? What's between me and you, Jesus of Nazareth? Well, let's see if we can figure out what is between <laughs> Jesus and this guy. Let's go back to Genesis 1 just for a moment. See. That'd be a good place to start, I think, because the spirit is older than the man he's occupying. Jesus is older than the body he's occupying. Both of them have known each other before. This is not the first time they've encountered each other. You follow me? So let's see. What's between them? Genesis 1.1. Genesis 1.1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. All right, I want you to stop just for a minute and think with me. When, Jesus is creating, when God is creating the heavens and the earth, what's in those heavens? Now, before you tell me, well, it's, it's space and all the planets. Nope, that didn't happen until day four. So it's not out there. What is out there? God and everything he created with him. He's creating all the heavenly host. That's what he calls it. You'll see in just a moment. He's creating all the heavenly host at that time. They're not planets. They're not stars yet. They are angelic beings. And they are weird looking at times. But mostly they are spirits. Uh, matter of fact, while you're thinking of that, that they are spirits, Come with me to verses 14 to 19. I want you to show you something else he did here. Then God said, let there be lights in the, hev the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens and to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Um, so God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And what was their function? To rule over the day and over the night, divide the, night from the, the light from the darkness. And God saw it was good. So evening and the morning were the fourth day. So let me go back up here to see. He set them for lights in the firmament of the heavens, and they were to what? Give light. That's, that's what lights would do, right? But here's the deal. They're supposed to be for signs. And for seasons, you're supposed to be able to tell things from that. And they rule over the day and over the night. When he creates people, what are they supposed to do? Rule over the earth. So those stars and all of that, according to what it looks like in the Scripture, that's going to be the home of all those spirits. Because he often calls the spirits and stars the same thing. 
They're often called, when he, when he speaks about stars of heaven, he, if the stars are going to fall, he talks about the powers of heaven being shaken, not simply gaseous balls of burning stuff falling around. He's talking about the angels themselves who occupy those gaseous balls, who are ruling over the night and the day. That host of heaven, look if you would at chapter 2 and verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. Here he says, thus the heavens and the earth and all of the host of them were finished. What? All the host of them. Is it, does that just simply mean there's a lot of things? Uh, no. That's the host of earth too. That's the host of heaven and the host of earth. The host of heaven we're going to see is our study, which we'll pick up on the 18th. The host of heaven is the angelic group. That's all the angels. So he creates the host of the heaven, an angelic group, and he creates the host of earth. That's the people and all the things that are on the planet. And they have a job to rule over that stuff. Everybody with me? So the, the angels have that. Now, the angels have heaven, rule over heaven. And they're going to rule over the light of the earth. What are the people's job? Rule over the earth. What happens if they decide to switch jobs? That's unclean. That's unjust. That's unrighteous. You're out of your place. You may not rule in heaven, men and angels. You may not rule on earth. Ever follow that? So look at Deuteronomy for me just a minute. Deuteronomy 4. History is a fun thing because in it you find out the truth. <laughs> Pick up with me at verse 15. Take heed, careful heed to yourselves, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. There was no form of God. They didn't see any image there. Why? They are the image. All right, let me go on further. Let you act corruptly, lest you act corruptly and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of any figure. That is, unless you decide now, you didn't see anything, and unless you decide that you're going to make something so that you can see me, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, or the likeness of any fish that is in the water beneath the earth, and take heed lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the host of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. I don't want you to worship the sun, the moon, the stars. I don't want you to worship that group, the host of heaven. I have given that to the other nations. Now look what he goes on to say. I've given that to the other nations, but the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace out of Egypt to be his people and inheritance as you are this day. So here's what he's telling you. When he's dividing up the nations, the nations are getting the host of heaven to rule over them. Remember when we said he gives them principalities and powers and all that? They're getting the, the opportunity to rule over them by teaching them what life is about, teaching them how to get back to God. But he's choosing Abraham, one guy, one people group that's going to be his. So you have the difference here. Don't look at the host of heaven and worship any of them. I've given that to the nations. You worship me because I belong to you. Does that make any sense to you? If not, raise your hand and go, no. So far, so good. All right. That's what the whole thing was about, kids. This is about who is leading who. The host of heaven is not to be worshipped by us, by those who know the living God. The host of heaven wasn't to be worshipped by the Gentiles either. They were supposed to be taught by them so they would come back to the one true God. All right. That's, that starts to tell you the first thing he's got going against him.
So if anybody's going to change that order, that's going to make a, a big problem with heaven. So let's go to number two. Jealousy, pride, and ambition in one of the cherubim create rebellion against the creation and status of man. That's the first fall or transgression listed in the Scriptures. That's him. It's the one we call the Satan. The one the Scripture may be calling Lucifer, the devil, the serpent, the old one. That's, that's him. That's the first fallen transgression. And he takes that rebellion that he does there, going number three, deceiving man and man distrusts God. That's the second fall or transgression. That's in Genesis 3. So you have the first fall coming with the kingdom of heaven, a transgression that takes place there, and he brings the transgression to earth and challenges the people on earth to be, look, they're, they're going to become lords of the earth. You follow me? They're going to be like God. That is God's goal. But they're going to go through training to do that. This guy is offering them a shortcut. If you eat of this stuff right here, the knowledge of good and evil, you'll take a shortcut. You'll be like God without having to go through that training. He doesn't want you to know this. He's keeping that from you because then you'll be equal to him. And they followed by trusting that one. That meant distrust of God. They follow this one, second transgression. That's the second fall. We call that the fall of man. Number three, or number four, there is the angelic usurpation of earth with genetic modification and transhuman violence and knowledge. That sounds big, doesn't it? I was impressed when I wrote that sentence. Um, I thought, wow, that's, that's really good. Here's what it means. This is Genesis 6. So turn to Genesis 6, all right? Now, I'm trying to give you enough of a history lesson this morning that lets you know how we got where we are and what's been the big problem here. Now, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now, you notice, I, it doesn't really say that the daughters necessarily wanted to be their husbands uh, or their, their wives, but that he, they, chose, they chose wives for themselves, okay? So what you have, sons of God, that's the kingdom of heaven. That's the angels there. They see the daughters of men. That's the daughters that were born to human beings. And they saw that they were lovely, and they decided they'd have their own race of people. They would have offspring with them, and they intermarried with them, and they had children. And the children are weird. They are not. Uh, now, let me, let me put a hold on that just for a minute. Please understand, this is where mythologies get their start. They take the real thing and twist it for themselves. You follow me? Because Atlas... Hercules are demigods. They're not real gods. They're demigods. What do I mean by that? They had a human mother and a, a divine father. That is this story taken to Greece. That's this story taken to, um, where's the next place I want to say? Uh, starts with S? No. Well, anyway, Sumeria. Sumer. They're, they have this story, only they expanded a little bit. This was known by the Jewish people in the book of Enoch as at least 200 angels who came to earth to Mount Hermon and intermarried with people there and taught people how to make herb teas, how to bring healing from the land. One particular one, called Azazel. He taught people how to make weapons. He taught people how to dig into the earth and pull out rocks and melt them down and turn them into swords and weapons of war. He taught them how to have violence. It also says he taught them how to make makeup so that you could dress up your eyes in such a way that it would make you attractive. 
and there would be a whole sexual sin start taking place from the attraction of people to one another. Now, that's all in the book of Enoch. That's not right here. But I can tell you this. It was based upon things that they knew, and the Bible is written to correct those things. You follow me? So it's telling us, yes, there were things that happened. There, were, uh, there was a rebellion with the sons of God, and yes, they did intermarry with the daughters of men, and yes, they did create an awful race, and that is exactly why he destroyed the earth. It isn't just because God says, yeah, people are not bad, not good. I think I'll just flood them all. No, it's because of what they'd become. It was an earth full of demigods. Perverse, if I can say this, genetically modified organisms. They were not human anymore. They were transhuman. They had strength that was beyond anything that humans could have. They were working with the divine as well as the natural. So they're supernatural and natural. They're doing weird things. You'll never get a Messiah out of that. He had to kill them off. He had to destroy them. That's why he flooded the earth. That puts newer understanding to it when it says that Noah's generations were perfect. That's not saying that Noah was a a well-behaved fellow that was perfect in his behavior. That means there was nobody in his genetic line that was along that Nephilim line. That that was the rebellion that was there. That's the third fall of transgression. Number five, that's the Tower of Babel and the rebellion and confusion. I I should say that after the fall, I'm sorry, after the flood, make sure I get time to do this. After the flood, the spirits of the Nephilim their sons and daughters, those demigods that were born there, the Nephilim are all destroyed. The angels are taken. The angels that did this, according to the book of Jude, were taken and put into and chained into Tartarus, the abyss, the deep pit. They were put down there for judgment someday. So all those angels that rebelled against God, that gave up their first estate, that quit living in heaven, were taken to Tartarus, and they were chained in darkness down in Tartarus. But the spirits of the Nephilim, their sons and daughters, started roaming the earth, and they became what we know as demons. They are the demons of the earth, all right? (coughs) This is not necessarily a demon that we're working with here. We don't know exactly that, all right? Number four, the, uh, number five, the Tower of Babel rebellion and confusion leading to regional supervision by the divine council. Here's what we mean by that. After the flood was all over, after everything had been done, <coughs> and, <coughs> and they're building the Tower of Babel, because of their rebellion against Almighty God, God divided them giving them all those different languages they're going to speak, they're going to become ethnic groups. Different ethnic groups are going to intermarry with each other. They're going to change their complexion tremendously. They're going to change their weaknesses and their strengths as they intermarry with each other. But he's going to split them apart. Since they didn't separate on their own, he's going to separate them. And of the divine counsel, that heavenly group that's in heaven that he uses uh, to uh, bounce ideas off, that he uses to teach how to be gods, if I can say it that way. Each one of those got a country to take care of, a region to take care of. And what they're supposed to do is teach them in that region what the region is about. If you're going to take people to um, northern Alaska, you better show them that you're really not going to have many salads anymore, okay? Salad may be a thing of the past. You're really not going to get much porridge anymore. What you're going to eat is blubber. Who's going to teach you to do that? I mean, who just naturally sits down and says, I know what I'll eat, fat out of a dead pig, fat out of a dead seal. Where am I going to get it, all right? They're going to teach them how to live in each of those environments. You've got at least 70 of them, 70 regions where they're going to go and teach those things. That's the divine council. And it worked good for a while until the members of the divine council over each of those regions, which the New Testament calls principalities and powers. 
when they started receiving the worship of people, they would become what we know today as gods. They're, they're not God like God is God. They are supernatural. They are divine. They're more than people are. But as soon as they started receiving that worship, the nations are lost. They're going to be lost. Okay? That's another fall. That's number six. When you have rebellion by members of the divine council, principalities and powers, leading to idolatry and abuse of authority, that comes to the fifth fall. And Psalm 82 is the one that promises, I'm going to judge you for this. It it gave a promise that the spirits were going to be judged for their rebellion against God. But that day had not come yet. Now you begin to understand why this guy says, Jesus, why are you here? Have you come to destroy us? He already knows. Judgment's coming my way. I know it's coming my way. He knows that's what's going to happen. But he thought it was later. He thought he still had time. He didn't think it was right now. Jesus doesn't tell him it's right now. Let me, let me go on further with you. Let's get, first of all, how did that guy get there? Well, let's offer you a po- possibility. Let's go to uh, Revelation 12. <coughs> <coughs> Are you still with me, or is the fire hose too much? Okay, all right. Let's look up here. 12, chapter 12, verse 1. Now, uh, yes. Oh, you are such a fine man. I will, not, I will not soon forget you for this. All right? Thank you, sir. Oh, yeah. That felt good. Oh, yeah. yeah. Verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. So what do we know about her? We know that she's ready to give birth, right? She knows she's going to give birth, and what's the child going to be? Well, (coughs) it tells us that in verse 5, she bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Wait a minute, I know who that is. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Right? That's the only one it can be. That's this authority. He's caught up to meet with them. Uh, he's caught up to, to be with the Lord and heir. So she's ready to have that child. Who is she? She's Israel. This is Israel. Uh, Joseph had seen a picture of this where the sun, the moon, the stars, and all that, that was all apart. They're all going to bow down to him and so on and so forth. He'd, he'd already seen all that. So Israel had already been recognized as a woman who is clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and the stars a garland around her head, 12 stars around her head. Already been seen that way. She's ready to give birth to a child, all right? So if I look at this timeline, he sees this time. John's looking, and here's a timeline that's starting somewhere right in here. In our timeline, that's there's creation back there, and this is all the way up. So I'm up here someplace with the prophets, somewhere with the, the later time of the prophets. And he knows that there is, uh, she's about to give birth to something. So it's li- right in this time right here, all right? So let's see what happens here. In verse 3, And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. So that's what's appearing in heaven to him. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. So as soon as Jesus is going to be born, what's he doing? He is waiting for the child to be born. It's like he's, uh, you know, just ready to lunge on that child. But he's also sent a third of the stars down at the time of the birth of Jesus, when it's getting close to that time. Some people want to say that all the stars fell with him back here. No, they did not. That, there was not a great rebellion took place. Satan took a long time to figure out how he's going to get everybody on his team. It wasn't just that he rebels and all of a sudden now everybody just follows him. Not so. 
They had been loyal to the one true God. The, the reason that God in, is going to give 70 members of the divine council authority over the nations is because they're still loyal to the one true God. It's going to be up in here in the time of the prophets when there's going to be a fall away from that. At a time when the rebellion of the divine council over the people they're ruling, that's when it's going to be. And now he can take a third of that angelic group and send to the earth. Scriptures say that there are myriads of angels. 10,000 times 10,000, it says. Thousands of thousands. So, being the literalist I am, I just went ahead and multiplied it out. That, that comes to an excess of a trillion. A trillion angels and trillion spirits? If he sends a third of them, that sounds a lot to me. I'm not a mathematician, so all of you mathematicians, don't come up later and say, you were wrong. It's got to be somewhere around 333 billion. That's a pretty good number of stars. That's a pretty good number of angelic spirits, spirits wouldn't you say? He's cast them to the earth. Which part of the earth? Wherever people are. So you're going to find people now who are going to be bothered by a new group. Bad enough to be bothered by the demons. But now you've got 333 billion more of them that are down here bugging people. Doing things with people. Why? To keep them from Messiah. He knows Messiah is about to be born. So he's <sighs> ready, going to kill that Messiah as soon as he's born. But whatever prevents him from getting that done, it's not going to, he, he motivates Herod to go and get some of it done, try to kill the Messiah if he possibly can. He's not going to get it done. Not then. Why? Because Messiah has a purpose. He has something he's going to do. All right? Have you come to destroy us? He knows that judgment has already fallen on the first groups. He knows that a bunch of people have already paid dearly, a bunch of, I should say, spirits have already paid dearly, that they've done something really, really wrong, and they've been judged for it. Then it goes, he's a promised judgment of rebellious spirits. Psalm 82 has already said you're going to have a judgment. He says, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. How does he know? Because when Jesus created everybody back here at creation, this guy, this, this spirit was already there. He's already seen Jesus. He's been seeing this second person of the Trinity this whole time. And here in this body is that second person of the Trinity. I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. So what's he got to do? He's got to tell him, shush. Stop talking. I don't want to be identified by you. I want my Father to reveal who I am. And until my Father is ready to reveal him, what's he going to say? Jesus is going to say, Father, I thank you that you haven't revealed yourself to this. I thank you that you, nobody knows you but me. And whoever you let me reveal it to, that's who's going to get to know. Unless the Father reveals it, Jesus doesn't want it known. Not by that bunch. So he's got it. And from now on, all the unclean spirits, you're going to see exactly the same thing with every single one of them. He's going to tell them, be quiet. Don't, don't speak. Don't say anything about that. Because that would be a supernatural revelation of him, but an unclean one. He wants the clean, supernatural version from the Father showing who he is. All right? Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the authority. He's your authority, whether you know him or you don't know him. Uh, whether you are religious or you're not religious really doesn't make any difference. Jesus Christ is Lord. And today, he's calling on you to bow before him. He's giving you grace right now. A judgment is coming for you just like it's coming for the, the, the angels and the other spirits. But today, he's saying to you, come home. Come home. I have a place for you. I have a life for you. 
I have a whole forgiveness for you. Come on, I've forgiven everything already. I've got you paid for in full. Come on home. Don't wander anymore. Father, thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the truth of the gospel. Thank you for the truth of the word of God. We pray that you'd bring this home to us, that you'd make this real to us, that every day we may live in the presence of our God. And I'll thank you for it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's stand together and sing, How Great Is Our God. Amen. How true is that? How great is our God? Praise his name. Listen, Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, this is, this is uh, it's all coming to a close. It's the one who's in charge of everything is bringing it to a close. Uh, you, you need to know that. I need to know that there's not much more time to fool around with entertaining yourself and trying to figure out what can make you happy again. Stop it. It's done past the happy time, kids. We're now into the full time. The time you can know Almighty God and get ready for His coming. You're going to rule and reign with Him one day. Start practicing right now. Pray like you've never prayed before. Study like you've never studied before. Learn to appreciate the presence of your Lord like you never have before. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ. How great is our God. We give you praise for His authority, for His rule over us. Thank you that He is the one who rules over us. Thank you for his goodness, his kindness, for his grace. Thank you for his delivery. All those people that got delivered in that synagogue that day from the, the tyranny 
of that spirit, the disorder that that spirit was going to bring. Thank you that Jesus Christ brings order. Now, thank you for what you're going to do in each one of us as you dismiss us with your grace and peace just now in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. I believe Al told me he's going to talk about husbands tonight. Amen. All right. So husbands. Why don't you bring those husbands. Yes. <laughs> Wives, if you want your husband corrected, bring him tonight. All right. God bless you. All right. See you later. God bless you. We'll see if we can't straighten them out. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs>